Well, hello and welcome everybody to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, um, we're going to be talking with Audrey Resnick, who is a data scientist here at Red Hat, and we're going to talk about um, managed services and data science. Um, and her topic today is what's the deal with managed services and model delivery. So it's going to be a bit of a technical overview. If you have questions, ask them in the chat and we'll relay them to the speaker at the end of this session. So Audrey, take it away, introduce yourself okay. and let's hear what you have to say today. All right. Well, good day, folks. Um, my name is Audrey and it's really a pleasure to be able to speak to you today about managed services and, and model delivery. This is going to be a, a gentle introduction onto what managed services are and how they can be used to gracefully deploy your, your model into um, a hybrid cloud. So the items that I'm going to uh, talk about today are exactly what are managed services, who cares about them, where do I find managed services, and what do managed services have to do with model delivery specifically? So we'll kind of go through a use case. And then the, the question that is really important, are these managed services easy to use? Because whenever somebody tells me about something new, that's usually the first thing I ask is, well, it sounds good. Is it easy to use? If we take a look at what generic IT managed services are, that will kind of set us up for the discussion, just to give your brain a chance to flow and get into the idea of services. Managed services in generic IT are the practice of outsourcing the responsibility for maintaining and anticipating a need, a need for and a range of processes and functions. And that's all in order to improve uh, IT operations and really to cut expenses. So we're going to look at everyday examples of managed services that you would find in a normal IT organization. And this will give us a really good baseline in terms of not only what these services are, but we'll get you thinking about what managed services could be available for data science. So the first thing that we have, and I think everybody's familiar with, is help desk. Then we go on to looking at equipment installation, and then along with that, hardware maintenance. Um, also with equipment installation, it's also moving, those moving services that could also be placed into that. Firewall and security, um, we need to be, be able to keep our organizations uh, safe and secure. We don't want people breaking in. We do that part of the ways by keeping up to date on antivirus patches, uh, various updates. Systems monitoring is a big uh, part of the services because we want to see how our systems are performing. Are they, are they performing well enough with the amount of users that I have or that we have if we add more users? Are those the systems being overwhelmed? Uh, and then speaking of being overwhelmed, what about disaster recovery? What happens if our, our main uh, facility or our shop is, is wiped out? Do we actually have the capability to bring those services for our customers back online elsewhere? And what about managed backups? I mean, that's the part how we get to disaster recovery is we should be having backups of, of our vital information. That's just, a small amount of managed services, and um, there are so many, many, many more. And today in data sciences, um, we have the complexity of adding uh, cloud as part of the platform that we work on, and there are a number of services that come with that. Therefore, the, the security, the data repos, the servers, the communications, sharing services, everything that we have is just a little bit more complex. So kind of understanding now what generic IT managed services are, Let's look at what kind of what I call managed services for data science or the services that would make sense uh, in data science uh, would be. And how would these services uh, help us deploy an AI ML application into or model into production? Whatever managed services we create, we have to allow the data scientists to focus on building their models. While building their solutions, data scientists being one of them, I want to experiment really with the latest bells and whistles. I don't want to deal with upgrades. I don't want to deal with supported versions. I don't want to have anything to do with compatibility issues. I just want to focus on my solution. However, this does not mean that a data scientist is able to walk right up to IT DevOps, hand them their laptop where they've been creating an AI ML model in isolation and say, okay, I'm good. I need this model to go into production tomorrow. Um, shouldn't do that. I've seen people do that. Uh, we need that cl collaboration with IT DevOps, and we need these um, services and methods that data scientists can use to work with um, DevOps 
to put their models easily into production and monitor performance. So in data science, um, there are a few steps that data scientists are interested in when thinking about creating uh, an AI ML model to solve a particular uh, problem. And I feel that these steps would make good managed services, so that's what we're going to go through and look at. This all starts with data acquisition. So we're looking at extracting and transforming uh, the data. We can integrate streaming data from OpenShift Apache streams for Kafka or reaching out across the hybrid cloud to pull in data um, for analysis from multiple platforms and data services. And we can use services, open source services, such as Starburst Galaxy to help us curate our data. Just one example. The next thing you want to do is to be able to run experiments and create the models. We can provide a notebook environment for model experiments and for the customers that would like to access the curated uh, data science packages. We have Anaconda uh, Commercial Edition integrated um, for those that are looking to take advantage of things like AutoML and then make use of things like uh, IBM Watson Studio. Once you've coded these experiments, and you've um, determined that they will fit the model that you have, and it, it looks like your model is good and primed, you want to be able to access any hardware accelerators to speed up the time to value. We partnered with NVIDIA to um, provide uh, GPU capability. And what we also then want to do is go ahead and then deploy these models as services. Once you have your models developed, you can use our source to image uh, templates that we have, or um, use OpenShift pipelines uh, to deploy and do endpoint for testing. Uh, you can also use uh, Seldon Deploy for, for model serving. Then we want to look at monitoring the models and tracking performance. We can continue to use things like Seldon Deploy or Watson Machine Learning and Watson uh, OpenScale for any of the model monitoring and performance tracking to know when you need to kind of retrain your model and redeploy it. And when you look at this overall picture that I've uh, set up here or this path, keep in mind that for any IT ops uh, that's looking at this or DevOps, this flexibility can really be a nightmare because they want a reliable, stable, reproducible environment for their customers. Um, which we hope that we can provide here. So now that we've defined these, this set of managed services, let's look at who beside data scientists would care about these services. It's not only the data scientists, but also the data engineers and IT ops that care about these services. And alongside with these managed services, there are other things that kind of really fall into place nicely. You want to have an AI ML model operational life cycle. Um, and that's kind of what I sort of outlined in the previous slide. The data scientists sort of want an environment and services in which they can not only do development work using kind of the latest bells and whistles that are open source, which is awesome, but also an environment that they can deploy their apps into production. And this environment should contain that exploration of data and the monitoring of deployed um, models and applications. The other thing that you want to care about is that production-ready platform, and this platform has to be something that IT ops feels really good about because the managed services, as I mentioned, can be a nightmare for IT ops as they want something that's reliable, that's stable, and reproducible for their, for their customers. The other item which kind of falls into place and is, is really important to think about is the flexibility to use any open source services that are that look interesting to you when you're actually going ahead and creating a solution. So being open source, just to remind you, means that it's essentially free to use and that usually with an open source um, service or item, there's a large network of users and developers who contribute towards updates, new features, offering support for new users. And lastly, the ability to kind of deploy and portability to move from the platform that you initially developed on. Uh, the ability to deploy and move your application allows you not to be tied to a particular vendor. And I personally, personally feel that to be very innovative these days, you need to be able to try a wide variety of technologies and services. And that means trying out a, a large number of vendors so that you can 
create the best product that you can for your customers. Now with all of these things said, there actually is a middle ground where we can make everybody happy. At least I feel that there is. So let's see if we can create kind of a data science managed services platform that satisfies this middle, middle ground, all these items that we've talked about. So we're going to start with infrastructure. The hybrid cloud platform, and we'll go for a hybrid cloud so that we have things on-prem inside our own network. Maybe we'll use something as Amazon Web Services as our public uh, cloud portion. Should offer very, um, a very consistent experience across on on-premises, uh, in the public cloud, as well as to the edge locations. And all of that has to be efficiently managed by IT operations. We need to look at compute acceleration. This hybrid cloud platform that we have should have integrations with hardware accelerators, such as GPUs, to help speed up any of our machine learning model development and inferencing tasks. This brings us to self-managed services. Uh, we could have all these services, but what would be really fantastic is to have all of these supported kind of on a self-service hybrid multi-cloud platform. And that's the platform that would really go ahead and empower anybody such as a data scientist or data engineer or software uh, developer to be agile and collaborative through the whole process. And that's without depending too much on IT operations for individual tasks. We don't want to fill out many tickets to say, I need access to this, or I need this type of service, you should be able to go in and self-manage that. Pick and choose what you need in order to get your job done. So here's kind of the conceptual architecture for this AI ML model services. Um, so we'll go into kind of a typical project life cycle. So we have data engineers that are working on gathering and preparing the data to make sure it's ready for the data scientists to develop their machine learning or AI models. And a managed service that we could possibly choose to use is, is Starburst. And Starburst is a fully managed service. You can access your data um, using Trino. Um, there's a premier uh, SQL engine. There's fax access, so you have access and that flexible um, flexibility to manage your, your data. The next thing that we have is the business of developing a machine learning model. An example of a managed service here would be something that you could use like Jupyter Hub that allows you to create Jupyter notebooks for experimentation. Now, I say Jupyter Hub and Jupyter notebooks for experimentation because you don't want to end up deploying a Jupyter notebook into production. Please don't do that. I've seen people that have tried to do that. It's not a good idea. However, for experimentation, when you're first getting started to take a look at what your data looks like in terms of how it pertains to the algorithm that you're developing and kind of looking at how your algorithm can kind of solve the problem that you've been tasked with, Jupyter Notebook, something like that is fine. And within this area, when we're developing the model, we need to also be able to determine or add any packages or libraries that we're working. So for pandas, um, we may need to use NumPy, we may, or for Python, we may be able to use pandas or NumPy. We might be able um, to choose something else, such as TensorFlow, if we're working on um, some sort of problem. But we want the data scientists at the end of the day to really be able to experiment with those packages. So again, whether it's TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, any others, the whole idea is to have these, these tools or these services available so that data scientists can do the experimentation. Next, we have to actually go look and deploy models in an application. Um, so again, this is kind of part of the model uh, life cycle. We want to go ahead and get our model and be able to deploy it and start some inferencing, um, making predictions kind of based on that data and see if uh, what the problem that you're trying to solve is, is going to be solved by, by what you're experimenting on right now. So there are managed um, self-managed services such as Selden Deploy, which help us build pipeline, build a pipeline, sorry, and actually go ahead and deploy our model. The work does not stop there when the model is deployed. I know some people that say, "Okay, I'm done." Uh, you have to continuously monitor and manage any of your AIML models that you create in production. Make sure that they're making the right predictions 
make sure that there's drift not happening. And you're not going to be doing that by staring at a monitor and looking at your model uh, performance through some simple little uh, script that you, you've written. You want to have some um, CIDA services that will give you alerts, uh, tell you when the model is drifting so that you can continuously, again, go ahead and monitor and, and manage your, your model in production to make sure that they're making those right predictions. And of course, when you do find something that is drifting or something that is not quite right, you need to have that ability to retrain those models as, as needed. So keeping that in mind that that's kind of our ideal sort of managed services and kind of the platform that would go along with it, let's actually take um, a normal, um, or I should say an actual machine learning use case that one of um, my own colleagues is working on and see if this kind of data managed services and model delivery platform that we've kind of come up with would actually work for that. So there is um, a project being undertaken by one of my colleagues, Guillaume Moutier for Metro L London, that has to do with license plate detection. So that all has to do with looking at the cars, grabbing the license plate, and being able to monitor traffic movement, car registration, and any sorts of licensing fees, again, through the license plate detection. That machine learning model has to have the ability to detect the license plate on a vehicle. If the vehicle is angled, the license plate needs to be righted, and the character is gathered um, through some ML uh, algorithms that have been developed. Data can then be stored or read or analyzed through Kafka in this instance. Um, and just for the folks that don't know, Kafka is an open source um, software that basically will provide a framework so that you can store, read, and analyze any of your streaming data. So for instance, here, if we're looking at some of that streaming data and we found a license plate um, uh, for somebody uh, where, where something uh, was notably um, important about that car, we could throw an amber alert. Finally, we have to actually go ahead and store that data, uh, whether we use an object warehouse or we go back to a vehicle registration database. Um, storing that data then gives us that ability to do analysis further. I mean, can we look at that data and do um, some analysis on traffic movement, congestion, parking, etc.? So now that we've kind of gone over this example, let's take a real managed services platform and as a data scientist, build out this AI ML detection service uh, for license plate detection. The architecture that we put together for managed services, this is my confession time, is are the services that a data, data scientist um, could use uh, actually exist as the Red Hat OpenShift Data Sciences uh, platform. And I'm going to use this platform, which we call um, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, to show you how you can use these managed services that we have, that we've actually discussed, um, also discussed, um, discussed to deploy an ML model. So this all kind of comes together when a user first starts using the Red Hat OpenShift um, managed services platform by having everything in one central location or shared UI so that the user can discover and access a variety of open source solution. Each managed service, whether it's Red Hat or a partner service component, uh, basically will go ahead and integrate uh, along with a series of quick starts and tutorials. So that way users can not only work with their self-managed services, they can also self-teach or understand things better about that managed services so that they can get started working with any of the, the components or services. And once users have enabled components, so in this example in the far uh, screen capture in the back, you see that I've enabled uh, Jupyter Hub. So that's a component that's going to be available for my use. Uh, again, along with all the quick starts and tutorials um, that will always continue to be available for, for people to look at. But let's specifically go back to this Jupyter Hub managed service and, and launch it. And 
what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to walk through a real demo because we know how those happen sometimes, but it'll be kind of a canned slide demo. So we'll be kind of clicking through things on slides and seeing how this all comes together. So again, we're assuming that our data set for the licenses um, has already been curated. Therefore, we begin by using JupyterHub so that we can experiment with the data. And just a note here, just because we use a JupyterHub managed service at this point in time, it doesn't mean that we can't integrate with any other services that is that are out there or go back. We certainly can, we have the freedom to do that. And you have the freedom and the ability to manage and use as many services as you like. Uh, realistically, when you're developing something, there may be other parts of the system that you haven't thought about and these managed services can fill in gaps that you may have not built out in your, your workflow. So we go ahead and we launch Jupyter Hub and we're going to go ahead and create a Jupyter Hub notebook image, which means that we're going to be packaging up a Jupyter Hub notebook into a container image that you can deploy to OpenShift. And you're going to be able to customize a number of things here. You're going to be able to customize the notebook image type. You know, are you working with a problem that requires you to use PyTorch? Or does the problem that you're working on require you to use TensorFlow? Do you just want to use a standard data science image just to do some exploration? Um, in this case, uh, we're going to go ahead and, um, actually, let me go here. Let me just back up a bit uh, and go back to uh, a container just in case folks don't know uh, what a container is. Um, a container, you can think of it as a single entity or unit that combines your entire runtime environment uh, which would include your application, any of the dependencies, uh, libraries, any of the Python libraries that you may be using, other binaries, and any of the configuration files needed to run your application. It's all bundled into one package. And by containerizing that uh, application platform as dependencies, uh, your differences in your operating system distributions and your underlying infrastructure are abstracted away. And that's really good because that means that it's something very portable now that you could use on-prem that you could probably use in the public cloud, say, I don't know, like AWS. So again, containerization just provides that clean separation of concerns um, so that developers can focus on their application logic and dependencies. And then, of course, the IT teams can focus on the deployment and management of that container without bothering about the application details, such as a specific software version or configurations to an app. In this case, I'm looking at, again at these standard uh, notebook images uh, that I discussed. And here I'm going to pick a base image that would contain the majority of the packages and libraries that would um, be needed for the license plate detection. So I'm choosing a TensorFlow notebook image. We can specify a deployment or container size that we feel that we would need for our machine learning model. We're going to choose a large container size uh, with limits of 14 CPU and 60 uh, gigabytes for memory requests. You have the ability to add one or more GPUs based on the type of data analysis that you're doing, and of course, in the ML code that you're working on. In this rendition, we won't use uh, GPUs, but remember, we can always go back and recreate our notebook image with different options if we choose so. And then users also have the ability to add environment variables that they would need on your project. So this is an example of adding an AWS S3 access key ID environment variables to access an S3 bucket, so access your data in uh, AWS. And we're going to um, then, once we finish adding in the secret access uh, key environment variable and its value, we click the Start button to spawn our new Jupyter Notebook image. And that can take a bit to spin up um, in that time being uh, to see what is happening. You can always click on the event log to uh, get a better idea of what uh, parts of your image are, are being rolled out and where you are in the image build process. So now you're in your Jupyter Lab environment. And as you can see, it's a web-based environment, but everything that you do here is in fact happening on the Red Hat OpenShift data science cluster that's sitting on AWS. This means without having to install and maintain anything on your computer and without disposing 
a lot of local resources like CPU and RAM, you can go ahead and still conduct your data science work in this stably managed environment. So let's go ahead and populate Jupyter Lab right now with our current license plate uh, get repo. So what we'll go ahead to do is go up into uh, the main menu, we'll choose get, and we'll choose clone a repository. And then we'll enter the name of the repository and press the clone button to clone the license plate workshop repository. Uh, note you could be asked for your get credentials, so you'd enter your credentials and then again um, press OK to continue. And what you'll then see is that actual license plate workshop repo files um, appear under the, the name pane in the left hand side of, of the actual window. We can then go ahead and open up any of the, the notebooks, um, and, or we could be creating notebooks. In, in this case, um, I'm showing just an example of a notebook that we use to recognize and extract the license plate numbers from car pictures. And we installed some libraries a little earlier on in this Jupyter notebook that weren't part of the container image. So that's also something Im important to realize is that not every image will be totally perfect for everybody. There may be additional items that you can install, and that's very easy to do. We'll go ahead and experiment with our model, and at the end, make sure that we can detect a license plate number. So along the way, we'll go ahead and um, package the model that we end up creating as an API. And um, earlier on, before we got to this point, we learned how to kind of create the code that would be able to extract the number from the given license plate. But of course, you can't use a notebook like this in a production environment. Um, I do know people that have tried to use Jupyter Notebooks in production. It's not a good idea. Be done. It's not a good idea. Therefore, we're going to package this code as an API that you can directly query from another application. And we do this by creating a Flask application. Um, a few explanations, though. The, the code that we wrote for this particular um, problem that Guillaume was working on ends up, all those Jupyter notebooks that you saw previously, end up being repackaged as a single Python file with, um, that we call prediction.py. And basically, it's just code that was in all the cells of the notebook and put together within a single file. And to use that code as a function that you can call, you just add a function called, say, predict, uh, that takes a string as an input, which would be the name of a picture, does a recognition, and sends back the result. And you could open the file directly in Jupyter Lab to see for yourself, um, but you would be able to recognize the previous code with the, the new function added. Then what we would go ahead to do is uh, launch our server. Um, so in this case here, we're just going ahead and launching uh, it locally. And we could go ahead and then test our Flask application and see if it's working. And it looks like our status returned that it was OK. So now that the application that we verified that it's working, we're ready to package it as uh, a container image and have it run directly on OpenShift as a service. And when you do that, you're able to call that service from any other application. So we'll go ahead and we'll build that application inside of OpenShift, which means we'll go to our main OpenShift dedicated platform. And within OpenShift, we want to make sure that we have a project namespace set up for us to work in. And I just called it user one project because my brain was dead. But we have uh, that project namespace now set up for us to work in. We go ahead and we're going to import our license plate code from the GET repository to be built and deployed. And we're going to select a number of options to create a deployment for this, this model. Most importantly, we want to be able to create a route that is a URL through which we'll be able to access our application. Um, this automated build process takes a few minutes then OpenShift will go ahead and deploy the application. And in this case, um, we ended up with that route that I was talking about. And this, again, will be the URL that we'll use to send images to. So we're going to go ahead and test. Uh, we want to actually test uh, again to see that the deployment actually works. So we have the application listening at the, at the route that was created during deployment. 
and we test it by simply clicking on that that route link that we saw previously or copy or pasting that uh, URL into a browser window. Once we go ahead that, and do that, we want to test um, our deployed AI ML application. We can also test our app status through curl or invoke um, a web request. Um, we definitely want to be able to upload images. But as our application is now a REST API endpoint, there are multiple ways that we can um, upload images to it. We can also run this app from a Jupyter notebook. Who would have thought? Uh, in this case, we'll go ahead and we'll add uh, an image, and I'm just calling it card.jpg, just a photo of a, of a car with a license plate. And I'll also go ahead and add that URL or route that I created in OpenShift. And if I go ahead and uh, run uh, the cell, I'll see that the prediction, and I got a screen capture of the car so that you could see what the license plate number was, that the prediction came back with VU69YDE, which is actually correct. So now that we've done that, let's take a look and see if um, the options uh, that we are talking about in the managed services platform that we originally uh, put together are actually there. And they are. Um, again, this was a conceptual architecture for managed uh, services and, and model delivery that, uh, that we were talking about. Um, but again, this is actually the architecture for the Red Hat OpenShift data science platform. And as we discussed, um, Earlier, we have that typical AI ML uh, model or workload lifecycle from gathering and preparing your data, developing your model, integrating your models in app development, and doing some model management. And in the bottom, the, the gray area that you see is the managed cloud platform that's provided either by Red Hat OpenShift Dedicated or Red Hat OpenShift Service on AWS. Uh, initially, AWS right now is the public uh, cloud for launch of this service. Uh, we'll be looking at Azure in the future. And we do include the NVIDIA GPU support. And then, of course, in the Red Hat Managed Cloud Services, we provide our core Red Hat OpenShift uh, data science offering. So that's going to have Jupyter, TensorFlow, PyTorch, source to image for publishing, and also tie-ins um, with other optional add-on uh, cloud services, things like OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka and our OpenShift uh, API management service. For our optional launch partners, uh, we do include um, the uh, service uh, uh, such as Starburst for data access and prep, and of course I mentioned Anaconda for package uh, distribution repositories. And then we also have software partner offerings like IBM Watson Studio and Seldon Deploy. So what did we learn today? Well, I hoped what you learned today that uh, what managed services are and that they are a big deal when it comes to deploying a model because they make the process easier for data scientists um, uh, to experiment on, for the data engineers to curate the data. Um, and when the data scientists have built the model, uh, DevOps then has the ability to easily deploy and monitor the model. And as for that fact, the data scientists also have the ability to deploy and monitor the model. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for your time and take any questions. Well, thank you um, for this, and you, you've covered off like many of my favorite subjects, one of which is, is uh, Jupyter Hub and, and Jupyter Notebooks, and, and I love the, the, the tip about trying not to or to refrain to, from using Jupyter Notebooks in production. Um, that might be the thing that I need to be reminded about the most. Um, so uh, the... The one request we got from the chat was if we could get a hold of your slides to share them with, um, with of folks. Course. And I let people know that I, I would make sure I could do that for them. But um, I, I just wanted to thank you. This has really been a very interesting um, approach to it because most of the times, um, if you're a data scientist or someone who dabbles in, in research, um, you end up trying to do all of this by yourself 
or, or with minimal IT support. So having I've a tried to do that before in my previous lifetime, uh, and it's it's not easy and it's not fun. And yeah. at the end of the day, when you're working on pipeline delivery, you're like, I'm a data scientist. I yeah. just want to work on my freaking code. Right. Why am I doing this? Um, and you don't have to with yeah. with managed services for for data science. Yeah, so I think this is like a huge step in the right direction, and um, that you know, there's I'm sure there are other managed services too, but it's wonderful to see it all working on OpenShift. So, um, thank you for for the tour de force today, and um, we'll share this with the folks that are out there in the universe um, looking to try this out, and um, look forward to having you as new um, features and functions come um, available um, to talk us through those as well. So, um, many thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me on board. Remember folks, questions, bring them on in. Um, you can always look me up on LinkedIn and get my, my contact through there and I'd be happy to, to answer questions. Perfect, all right. Thanks everybody and um, take care and we'll talk to you all soon.